good morning. Good morning. All right. Well, this week was a big week. Uh, we had our Converge District Conference Foundations, and I have this backpack that I got, not this year, but last year. Isn't that cute? What a nice little bag I got. And I actually have some things in this bag this morning as my introduction for my message. Uh, so I'm going to ask you uh, what, it, what these items are, okay? So are you ready? Are you wondering what's in the bag? I know you are. You're really curious. First I have, what's this? It's a mirror. What, what, what do you do with a mirror? What, what's the point of a mirror? You look what? What are you looking for in a mirror? What are you looking for? You look at yourself. You need to, Wow. Ooh, I need to trim my beard. I'm not so great. Uh, but a mirror, we, we use a mirror to see ourselves, right? Okay, I've got another item. You ready? You ready? Here it is. What are these for? Ooh, I can see some of you really closely. <laughs> Seriously, I'm looking right at your face. It's like right in front of me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> What, what do we do with the what do we do with a pair of binoculars? What do we do with these? What are we looking for? What are we looking at? Deer. Deer. <laughs> True. What else do we look at? We're looking at something far away, right? We're looking. We're we're trying to see something that's far away uh, from us. Are we? Do we use the binoculars to look at ourselves? No, 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 no. We, we look at a binoculars to see something far, far away. So there's a big difference between these two. They both have uh, uses, uh, but the reason I point these out is because with a mirror, with a mirror, we're, we're looking kind of in, right? We're looking in. With binoculars, we're looking what? We're looking out. Okay, you're following me. That's good. So there, today we're going to talk about prayer because we can have... Prayers that are mirror prayers. What do I need? What, what, what am I looking for? What do I want? What do I hope for? What, what are my needs? Now, it's not always bad to pray for our needs. We're going to see that in the text today. But if it's all a mirror prayer, we're just thinking about who? Ourselves, right? Uh, what about a binoc- if, you, if you pray a binocular prayer, what are you looking for? You're, you're trying to see out, right? We're looking out. And we're, we're looking at God. And who he is in his greatness and his glory and his power. And now thankfully, God isn't far away. He is. He is grand. He is beyond what we can fathom or imagine. He is ever present, but he's also near to us. Isn't that good news? He's near to us. He calls us to pray to him. But binocular prayers would be prayers that would be looking out, saying, Lord, what do you want? What's your desire? What's your will? I want that to be done rather than praying a mirror prayer where I'm praying all about myself. And all about what I want, what I need. Now, I'll give you one more illustration, but I didn't bring this. I couldn't fit in my backpack. A window. A window. What does a window do? You can. What do you? What's the point of a window? Is that you're able to see? Well, you can see through to something else. So, like, if we look out, if everyone, everyone, turn around and look out. Everyone, go ahead, turn around, look out. We can see the lobby out there. We can see the cafe. Hey, good morning, cafe. We can see, someone's waving in the cafe. I can see that because of the window. You can see through it, right? What I think prayer does is prayer actually gives a window to our own heart. We're able to see what others can see even as we pray, what is going on in my heart? Prayer does that. And Jesus actually tells a parable about it. So I'm going to show you on the screen. Let me show you the beginning of this parable from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 12. This is just the introduction. This isn't the sermon. It's just the introduction. Hang in there. He also told this parable to some, look at it, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. So I love how Luke tells us what the parable is about, what it's for. He's telling us this parable. He tells the parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. And here it is. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. This is a mirror prayer. You ready? This is how the Pharisee prayed. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I, I fast twice a week. I, I give a tenth of everything I get. The Pharisee in this parable is really 
doing all three of the disciplines we talked about last Sunday. Giving a tenth of everything he has. He's praying in the temple and he fasts. How, how often? Not once, but twice a week. He's doing the disciplines. He's doing the right things, but he's doing them for the wrong reasons. What does he want? He's praying this way because he wants, wow, you are so righteous. He wants applause from others. He trusts in himself and he looks down on everyone else, especially that tax collector, which we'll get back to that tax collector in a minute. But this Pharisee is boasting. He, he's, his heart is filled with pride. His, this prayer is a window into his heart. His heart is filled with pride. He's thinking only of himself. It's a mirror prayer. So is this a kingdom prayer? <laughs> well, it depends on which kingdom we're talking about. <laughs> right? The kingdom of God or the kingdom, the little, the little kingdom, the tiny kingdom of the Pharisee. So we're going to talk about prayer today. How should we pray and how should we not pray? And again, prayer is a window into our soul, into our heart. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 7 through 15 today. Matthew 6, 7 through 15, page 859 in that hardback CSB copy of the scripture that you might have grabbed off the cart today. Matthew 6, uh, 7 through 15. Today we're going to continue our Kingdom Come series, and we're going to focus on kingdom prayer. Now, here's what Martin Lloyd-Jones says about prayer. I thought this is a a great quote. He says this, prayer is the highest activity of the human soul. Man is at his greatest and highest when upon his knees he comes face to face with God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is a meeting with the God of creation, the God who made you and me. The all-powerful, almighty God. We, when we pray, we're coming face to face with God. In our notes this morning, we're going to talk about two things. Number one, how not to pray. How not to pray. There's two ways we should not pray. First, we should not pray thoughtlessly. We should not pray thoughtlessly. Look at verse 7. Here's what Jesus says. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Now, the context of this is interesting. Some translations say pagans instead of Gentiles. So Jesus is saying, don't pray like the pagans. What do they do? They babble. They, the ESV says they heap up empty words. Why do they do that? Commentator Craig Keener says this. Pagans piled up as many names of the deity as they were entreating as possible, hoping at least one would be effective. It's a a thoughtless prayer. John Stott describes this kind of babbling as any and every prayer which is all words and no meaning, all lips and no mind or heart. So the mouth is speaking in our prayer, but the mind and heart are not engaged. I've done that. I've done that. Have you done that in prayer? Where you're just speaking words and you're not really thinking about what you're saying. We do that. We've been thoughtless in prayer. There's actually a lot of pithy Christian sayings that we throw into our prayers. And we say them without really understanding what they mean or what we're saying at all. So let me give us three ways to avoid babbling. Okay, Three ways to avoid babbling. Number one, remember the one to whom we speak. When we pray. We should remember the one to whom we speak. We are speaking, think about this, to the God of the universe, the creator of all. He touches the mountains and they smoke. He is a consuming fire, Scripture says. We ought to be thinking about what we are saying to Almighty God when we pray. He is worthy of our thoughtful prayers. That's number one. Remember the one to whom we speak. Number two, to to avoid babbling, slow down. And think. (laughs) Slow down and think. Often we find ourselves babbling in prayer because we're in a hurry. We want to finish the prayer so we can eat. (laughs) We just, all right, let's eat. That's what we really, that's what we're here for. And it's a thought, it leads to thoughtless prayers. Or or to get on to the next thing. Let's get on to what we really want to do. And we're not really focusing on what we're, we're, we're praying. So we need to slow down. We need to think. Uh, If you find yourself babbling, 
stop, slow down, and think. Ecclesiastes is helpful. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says this. Do not be hasty in to, do not haste, be hasty to speak and do not be impulsive to make a speech before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. So long, drawn out prayers are not necessarily more effective. Remember, Jesus says at the end of verse 7, they imagine they'll be heard for their what? Many words. You can pray short, heartfelt prayers. It's not the quantity of our words, but the quality of our motives in our heart. Third way to avoid babbling, pray scripture. This has really, really been helpful for me. I, I, maybe you've done this as well. Pray scripture. See, the word of God, this book, is, has some powerful prayers in it. Powerful words that we can utilize in our prayers. It gives us language uh, for thoughtful prayer. Let Scripture give you the words. If you don't know what to pray, pray the Psalms. Pray, pray uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. If someone is struggling with worry or anxiety, like you, you can certainly pray a prayer for them, but pray Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So you pray for that friend of yours. God, I pray that you would help them not to worry about anything, but in everything by prayer. You, you know how you know what I'm saying? You're, you're praying the words of Scripture as you pray. And God, I pray that the peace, your peace, that passes all understanding will guard his mind, will guard her mind in Christ Jesus. Now you have words. You have language for prayer. Pray Scripture. I'll give you several. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Psalm 34, 18. Psalm 46, 1. Isaiah 26, 3. I mean, you can go through all of Scripture and find lots and lots of helpful words for prayer. And the Word of God is powerful, amen? Word, the Word of God is powerful, and we can use that as we pray, and it will give us uh, the language for thoughtful prayer. We won't babble. So we should not pray thoughtlessly. Second, we should not pray faithlessly. Don't pray faithlessly. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. Jesus says, don't be like them. Because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. So we should not be faithless in our prayer. Gentiles, pagans who don't know God, they don't have faith. They just throw up a bunch of words hoping something will stick. Jesus says, you don't need to pray like that. You pray, don't pray faithless prayers. Pray faithful prayers. Pray trusting prayers. Prayers. In fact, James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8 says, If we lack wisdom, we should ask God who will give abundantly to those who ask. And when we ask, to ask in faith without doubting. We don't need to doubt. Why should we not doubt? Because Jesus basically tells us in verse 8, God is your, what does it say in verse 8? Because your what? Father knows what you need. Father, God is my Father. Just think of that. God is not an angry deity that needs to be appeased as these pagan gods are. And Jesus says, God, your Father, is all-knowing. He is sovereign. He's all-powerful. He's the eternal God. Do we really think in prayer that we are telling God, the God of the heavens, the God who created all, the God who knows all, do we think we're telling him something he doesn't already know? Do we really think that? That would be a... Uh, that would be a faithless prayer. Like, we don't really understand. It's not like we're, we come to God in prayer and we say, Oh, God, would you help this person in my life? That This person is really struggling. And God is up in heaven and says, Oh, oh, wait. what? I didn't realize that was going on in your life. I'm so, thank I'm so glad that you made me aware of this. Now I can do something about it. I wasn't aware. No, God is always aware. He's all-knowing. So... Believe that God knows. and Believe that God can do anything. Believe that God loves you. He is your Father. In fact, Jesus says your Heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask. God is our Father. is so important. Uh, actually, just turn over to in Matthew chapter 7. We're in 6 right now, chapter 6. So it's not very far from where we are. Matthew 7, verses 9 through 11. I just want you to see this. This is also in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 9 through 11. Jesus says, Who among you, if a son, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, 
know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So again, this theme that God is our Father in heaven. Now, I'm a father. I have three daughters. I know what they want. You know why? Because they tell me. (laughs) I always know what they want. But I also usually, usually know, with the help of my wonderful wife, I usually know what they need. Now, what kind of father would I be if I did not give them food (laughs) or clothes or a ride somewhere where they need to go or shelter unless they got on their hands and knees and begged me for it? What kind of father would I be? I would not be a good father. I would be a manipulative, power-hungry, cruel father if I made them just ask and ask and ask before I would be willing to give them what they need. And Jesus, and so I know how to do it. I know how to give what my daughters what they need. So how much more does a perfect heavenly father know what you need and will give you when you ask what you need. In fact, Jesus says, I'm evil in comparison to God. You are evil in comparison to the, the holiness and the perfection of God as Father. So, of course, God knows what we need. And so we can pray believing prayers that he will give us what we need so we can come to him. God is an infinitely good Father. Now, this may be, as we talk about this, it may be difficult for you to really think about God as a father because your earthly father failed you miserably. Maybe your earthly father abused you or abandoned you or ignored you. And I want to say, I'm, I'm so sorry that happened to you and you need to know that that is not what God is like. God is a perfect, loving, compassionate, wonderful Heavenly Father. And God will give us what we need. Not always what we want. (laughs) Amen? Some of you are like, I really wanted that, and God didn't give it to me. He doesn't always give us what we want, but he promises he'll give us what we need. And we'll see what our needs are later in the message today. So you might be wondering as you're sitting here hearing this, you're saying, well, if he knows what we need before we ask, why even pray? What's the point of prayer? If God already knows, he's going to give it to me. I'll get, I'm glad you asked. I got three reasons why we should pray. Three reasons. Are you ready? Number one. Number one. Three reasons why we should pray. Number one, I think it's a good reason. God tells us to pray. It's a matter of obedience. God tells us to pray. Uh, Colossians 4, 2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything for this is God's will. For you in Christ Jesus. It is God's will that we pray constantly. He tells us to pray. It's a good reason to pray. Here's a second reason. Number two, prayer humbles us. Prayer humbles us. Prayer reminds us that God is God and we are not. We're not God. We need him. 1 Peter 5 says this. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time. Casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. For you. So prayer humbles us. In fact, just think about the posture of prayer. We fold our hands, we close our eyes, we bow our heads. That is a vulnerable position, is it not? We're closing our eyes. We're bowing our heads. We're in this vulnerable position. That is a humbling posture. In prayer, we are reminded that we cannot do life on our own. We need God. We trust and we are totally dependent on God for all things. It humbles us. Prayer humbles us. And as we cast our cares upon God, you know what? The good news is he cares about you. Believe that. This is the God of the universe. The God of the universe cares about you. So pray, believing this truth. Third reason to pray, and this is a real mystery, okay? But it's true. Number three, God acts through prayer. God acts through prayer. Now, I quoted this verse last week, but we'll look at it again. James 5.16, the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. 
And we see so many times in Scripture where someone prays and God moves. God does something. God works through prayer, and he knows what we need before we ask. Now you say, well, isn't God going to fulfill his sovereign purposes? And the answer is yes. But God works when I pray? Yes. This is, this is a divine mystery, and don't let it hinder your praying. Don't say, well, if God's going to do this anyway, I don't need to pray. No, we need to pray. God works. God acts through prayer. Prayer does good in, internally and externally. So how not to pray? Don't pray thoughtlessly and don't pray faithlessly. Here's the, here's the part two. So we talked about how not to pray. Let's look at how to pray. How to pray, verses 9 through 17. There's two priorities in, our, in, in how to pray. Two priorities, and they're in order. Number one, uh, God's kingdom first. God's kingdom first. Look at verses 9 and 10. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, this sounds really familiar, doesn't it? This is what they call the what? The Lord's Prayer. Okay. Now notice, Jesus, now how many grew up saying the Lord's Prayer in church? Go ahead, raise your hand. Okay, almost, almost everybody in here. It's not bad to pray the Lord's Prayer. It's a wonderful prayer. It's great. It's a great prayer, but it's actually more than a great prayer. It's actually a pattern for how to pray. Did you know that? Because notice Jesus says, pray like this. Pray like this. Here's a pattern. Here's a way in which you ought to pray. The, the first two words of the prayer, let's say it out loud. Our, let's say it together. Our Father. Again, Father in heaven. God. We covered this already, but we need to know this was shocking language to the original audience. The Jews in Jesus' day would call God Adonai, Lord, Yahweh, God, but never Father. They wouldn't call him Father. He's, he's God. Commentator Dan Doriani says, Jewish writings stressed God's transcendence as Lord and sovereign. Father suggests imminence. He is personal, approachable. See, Jesus came so that we could have access to the Father, so we could call God our Father. So th this is true for all believers in Christ. He is indeed our Father in heaven. But you know what? You, you need to know this is not true for all people. Contrary to popular belief, every human being is not a son or daughter of God. We are all born as image bearers, we're all born as created. God created each one of us in our mother's womb. We're, we're image bearers, created in the image of God. But not, we're not all born children of God. We're born, actually, every one of us, we're born natural enemies of God because of our sin. We've been born into sin, and we also choose to sin. We choose to rebel against God. We are God's enemies, Romans 5.10. Calling God our Father is a blessing, not a right. It's a blessing given to those who repent of their sin and receive Jesus Christ alone by faith. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it this way. He says, It is only those who are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who can say, Our Father. Now, I know this is an unpopular doctrine today, but it is the doctrine of the Bible. Listen to Galatians 4. I want you to see this. Galatians 4, 4 through 7 says this, when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that, so that, look at this, we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. So every one of us, every one of us in this room, we were born into sin. We chose to rebel against God. We were slaves, the text says, slaves to sin. We did nothing but sin. But God sent his son Jesus to redeem us, to buy us out of that slavery, to save us, to bring us from darkness to light. And when we come to Jesus in faith, we receive adoption as sons. We receive every benefit uh, as sons. And we are sons and daughters of the king when we put our faith alone in Jesus, and then we, may, then we can call him Father. So have you done that? Have you turned from your sin and yourself and put your faith alone in Jesus to save you from your sins? 
He, he loves you so much, he died in your place on the cross, paying your penalty in full. And Jesus rose from the grave, conquered sin and death. This is the good news, but it's only good news if you respond to it by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. You can do that right now where you're sitting. And I hope you will. So our Father, verse 9 again, we pray, our Father who is in heaven, and then we pray that God's name would be honored as holy. You see that in verse 9? God, that's hallowed be your name. Yeah, that's, may your name be honored as holy. Verse 10, look what it says. Your kingdom come. Boy, that would be a good series title for a sermon series, wouldn't it? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus tells us, God, be, here's what he says. Be God-focused in your hearts, in your lives, in your mind, and you know what's going to happen? You're going to be God-focused in your prayers. It's that window that, sh- that we see, that God sees our heart. God's name first. God's kingdom first. God's will be done first. So kingdom Christians prioritize God's name, kingdom, and will. Above our name, our kingdom, and our will. Let's not arrogantly think that we know God's will. We know God's will from his word, but we don't know what God's will is for the situation we're in. A decision we have to make. We have to trust in God and humbly submit to his will and his plan. Even if it's not our will or our plan. We ought to pray that God's will be done. How? On earth as it is where? In heaven. Just imagine that for a second. Imagine how that works in heaven. God says, I want this done. And the angels are just scrambling over one another to be the one to do it. I'll do it. No, no, I'll do it. No, I want to do it. That, that's how it happens in heaven. They're eager. They're excited. They're joyful in doing exactly what God wants every single time immediately. Just imagine, what if we live this way when we open the word of God? <laughs> we read what God tells us to do, and every Christian is eager to do his will immediately and gladly. Boy, the world would change, wouldn't it? John Stott says, true Christian prayer is always a preoccupation with God and his glory. In our prayers, do we give priority to his name, not ours, his kingdom, not ours, his will, not ours? Now, this is hard for us. Let's just be honest. <laughs> Why? Douglas O'Donnell nails it. He says, we are so concerned with ourselves and our Little kingdoms. Oh, I need this. God, would you do this for me? Right? We, we, we pray mirror prayers. We don't pray binocular prayers nearly enough. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this. We tend, to, uh, he, this is good. We tend to be so self-centered in our prayers that when we drop, to our knee, drop on our knees before God, we think only about ourselves and our troubles and perplexities. Isn't that true? Sometimes. I admit, I would, I'll tell you, in, sometimes in my prayer, I just go straight to my needs, to my wants. I don't even think about God's name, God's will, God's glory in my prayers. I need to be reminded constantly, even this week I was just reminded, wow, I'm, I, need to, I need to make God's will first, priority. God's kingdom first, God's name first. So here's a challenge for you, for us, really, all of us. This week... As you pray, think, stop, slow down, and pray first. Start with these three requests. God, may your name be holy. God, may your kingdom come. God, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. So pray what kind of prayers this week? Binocular prayers. Yeah. If we do... Here, here's what I think could happen is that our desires may even be conformed to God's desires, changed. God may change what, what we thought we wanted or needed may change. So give God a chance to speak into our hearts, uh, his priorities into our hearts, submit to his will and not to our will. How, how to pray? We pray God's kingdom first. Second. Second. My needs second. Okay, my needs second. Look at verses 11 through 13. We'll read those three verses. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we also forgive, have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So it's not wrong to pray for our needs. God, as our Father, loves to hear from his children. So go ahead and pray. Ask God for what you need, knowing that he knows what you need before you ask. But let's talk about the three needs in these verses. First, daily bread. Daily bread. What, what is daily bread? I, I think we think, well, it's my daily needs, and that is true. I think it's a reference back to the Old Testament. Manna. Manna in the wilderness. The people of Israel were provided literally daily bread on the ground. When they would wake up, there would be bread on the ground. God provided. He is the great provider. God gave them what they needed every day. Craig Keener says this, if God, look at this, if God provided for a whole people through 40 years of landless wandering and unemployment, how much more should we trust him for our basic needs? First need, daily bread. Ask that God would provide what we need every day. He is the provider. So let's trust him. That's the first need. Here's the second need. Forgiveness. Verse 12. Forgiveness. We need forgiveness for our debts. Now that's a financial term that Jesus uses here. But we don't owe God money, do we? Like physical money? No. Uh, The debt symbolizes our sin against God. We had a debt that we could never pay. And that's why Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins. He paid the debt we could never pay. And Jesus did it. He paid it all on the cross for us so we can be forgiven. But we do fall into sin, don't we? And we should ask for forgiveness. And we can ask with confidence that Jesus has already paid the price for that forgiveness. What a wonderful gift. But now we need to forgive our, what? Our debtors, those who have sinned against us. Jesus expounds on the importance of forgiveness in verses 14 and 15. So skip ahead and look at verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. Jesus is emphasizing the importance of forgiveness. So ask God to give you the ability to forgive others. Maybe a big debt. Maybe what someone did to you is big and painful. But ask God to give you the ability to forgive that person, to release that person. God has forgiven, think about this, our infinite debt against his infinite holiness. We have sinned against him. We deserved eternal hell and God forgave us. So can we not forgive someone who has sinned against us? We need to learn to forgive others for what they have done. Uh, Ephesians 4, 32 is really clear. Be kind and compassionate to one another. What does it say? Help me out here. Say it out loud. Forgiving one another. Just as what? God has also forgave you in Christ. Whoa. God forgave us in Christ. An infinite debt. And so we need to learn to forgive one another in that same way. Uh, Commentator Dan Doriani says, After disciples experience grace, they manifest grace. But those who show no grace demonstrate that they have never tasted it. Have you tasted God's grace? You need to share it. Share it with others. You may be having trouble forgiving someone today. You know what? You you can't do it on your own. You need the Holy Spirit to give you the capacity. And that's why you need to pray. Say, Lord, help me forgive this person who has so injured me, has so hurt me. Ask God to help you forgive. It's one of our needs, actually, to forgive. Here's the third need. Third need is deliverance from the evil one. Deliverance from the evil one. It says, uh, Jesus says, we should pray, do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us. Temptation. God, now, God doesn't tempt us to sin. Scripture is clear about that. The evil one, Satan, does. He does tempt us to sin. Craig Keener puts it this way. He says, the prayer is that the testing will not lead to falling. God's purpose in testing is to conform our faith. The evil one's purpose in testing is to weaken it. So the heart of this request is that God will help us endure a time of testing to help us grow in our faith. We we can pray Psalm 141, verses 3 and 4. This might be worth, uh, this is certainly worth memorizing. Psalm 141, verses 3 and 4. Look at it on the screens. Lord, set up a guard for my mouth. 
ooh, maybe we should just pray that. <laughs> Lord, set up a guard for my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let me, do not let my heart turn to any evil thing or perform wicked acts with evildoers. Do not let me feast on their delicacies. As we pray thoughtful prayers, this would be a thoughtful prayer to pray from our hearts. Three needs, daily bread, forgiveness, deliverance from evil. Now notice, only one of these three has to do with our physical needs, daily bread. The focus is not on physical health and safety, temporary comforts or happiness, or our hopes and biggest dreams. That's not in here. That's not a focus at all. Yet how many... How many of our prayers are dominated by those requests? Now, it's not wrong to ask for these things. What is wrong is to prioritize these things, making them the ultimate, the most important thing. And if I don't get that, then I don't trust in God anymore. We need to pray his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Submit to him, his rule. Now, when I was in Romania in 2023, not this past summer, but a year ago, it was a really interesting experience for me. We went to a gypsy church, uh, and it was wild. Okay, so that's a picture. They, they wore their traditional, you know, outfits, and the music was loud, eardrum bursting. Okay, and they sang loud and these people were so excited that a pastor from America was there. And so I gave a little short message that was through a translator and after the service this is what surprised me. After the service all these people came up to me. There you see I I'm at the top I'm at the stage with with a a translator and and it was just this lineup of people coming and asking for prayer and I'm thinking no one does this in my church. Not a lineup like that. What is going on? No, it's not a knock on you guys. I love you guys. And I know people do come for prayer. Okay, so uh, just a joke. But there was a lineup of people, and they all wanted me to pray for them. Why? Because they had this, this backache, right? They had this headache. They had this earache. They had the, and it, it almost felt like I was one of those, they thought, that I was one of those TV heal, faith healing preachers who like, like had some magical power or like if I touched them on. In fact, it, it was very uncomfortable for me. They would actually grab my hand and put it on their head or on their shoulder or on their back. And I'm like, oh, what's going on? I don't have any power here. You know, it wasn't. I was like, what is happening right now? And of the about, I would say about 30 people that came up for prayer, every single one except one, asked for some kind of prayer over a physical ailment. They were thinking only about that, right? One person, one woman, at the very end, one woman asked that her daughter would be saved. And I was like, oh, finally. (laughs) Something that I'm not praying for someone's backache or or their headache or their ear or their whatever. So then, of course, I'm like thinking, you know, I'm so much better than these people, right? Like I've I've become the Pharisee. I would, I would never, and then I'm like, wait a minute. How often do I do the same thing in my prayer? Maybe it's not for a physical need, but it's for a want. It's for my will to be done and ignoring God's will altogether. How often do we do that? We do that all the time. It made me think, how often am I praying mirror prayers and not, and not binocular prayers? Seeing the big picture, seeing God in his greatness. So my heart needs to change. <laughs> our hearts need to change in our prayer. We need, to be, we need to learn to be preoccupied with the greatness of God. Uh, has anybody seen the Northern Lights recently? Just even this week? They were, I mean, I've seen incredible pictures. You cannot go outside and see the Northern Lights and think about how great you are. Unless you've got a mirror in your hand and you're looking at yourself while the northern lights are up. I look so good. Me, me. Right? So how do we how do we change our hearts? We need to look up. 
look out and see God's greatness. We need to look at his word and we say, Lord, I, when I look at your word, when I see how great you are, and I look at myself, I realize how sinful I am, how selfish I am, how, how focused I am on myself. Do you remember the, uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector? Remember the parable we started with? Let's finish it. The Pharisee's praying a mirror prayer, puffed up with pride, all about himself. He's not like that filthy tax collector. And now Jesus finishes the parable. Look at this. But, but the tax collector standing far off, far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So I have to ask us this question this morning. Are you the Pharisee or the tax collector? Do you know by the way you pray? It actually reveals what's in your heart. Are you the Pharisee or the tax collector? What do you tend to be? Are you, are you the self-absorbed religious snob, thinking you're better than everybody else? Or are you the broken sinner, well aware of your need for God's grace? Now, if you're the broken sinner, you, you need to know you can come to Jesus right now. And you can pray, and he will meet you in your need. He will give you mercy as you humbly come to him. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. Jesus will respond when you call out to him in prayer. If you're the Pharisee, like me, you have a chance to humble yourself. You have a chance to humble yourself. I, I, I am sometimes the Pharisee. I need to repent of my self-righteous attitude. I need to learn to humble myself and say, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. I need your grace just as much as anybody else. So whether you're a Pharisee or a tax collector today, you need to know that forgiveness, grace, mercy is offered to all who humbly come to God in faith because of what Jesus did on the cross. We're going to focus on what Jesus did. Let's, let's pray together, and then we're going to take the Lord's Supper this morning and be reminded of this good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for the forgiveness that you offer to us. God, you have, you have forgiven an eternal and infinite debt that each one of us owes, and it's been wiped away, and you've adopted us as your children, and we are able to call you our Father. What a great and powerful gift that you've given to us. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for all that you've done for us. And I pray that even as we've heard this message today, that you would, that you would work in us. You would help us to learn to pray prayers that are focused on you, your name, your kingdom, your will above our needs. And we thank you that we can bring our needs to you, but help us to do it with an open hand. God, we thank you for what Jesus did on the cross, and we want to remember his body and his blood that represents the, the opportunity for us to be redeemed, to be forgiven and brought to you. And so bless us now as we take communion. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. And everybody said.